So folks, as we speak live, old Donnie is in meltdown mode, mega super duper meltdown mode, and he doesn't want you to know about it, but reporters caught him and are dishing the dirt. And before those, that dirt gets deleted and scrubbed from the internet, which is what Trump does when he's truly humiliated. I have captured it here and I'm bringing it to you. So hit the like and subscribe button, share this far and wide because he is embarrassed because of what Joe Biden did to him, destroying him in front of the entire country and really the whole world watch that speech, but also his own legal failings and his own financial failings. So Donald Trump had two goals in the last few days, convince his supporters and the country that he's just as rich as he's always claimed to be. And he's failed to do that. And also guys to paint Joe Biden as sleepy and as weak and as without any ideas of his own and all of that. And in both fronts, he's failed. And when you see his reaction to his failure, catch up everywhere, broken stuff everywhere, flying stuff everywhere, it will make not just your weekend, but the rest of the friggin' month. Put up because the appeals process takes a long time and just to uh, you know assure it will be there. So it looks like Donald Trump has come up with the bond for this case. The deadline was right around the corner. Um, technically, it is tomorrow, but because deadlines fall on weekends and court cases are given till Monday, so Donald Trump is posting the bond in this case now. So. And he's also filed, as you said, a notice of appeal. So he's asking the appeals court to weigh in on this. He has also asked the trial court judge to lower the amount of the damages that the jury awarded E. Jean Carroll in that case, saying that they were excessive. So all of this will be something that will be argued. But it looks like he has made this deadline, filing a bond with the judge and asking the judge to approve it. You know, that is just one of these two massive judgments that Donald Trump is facing. He's also facing a deadline at the end of this month to post a bond of four hundred and fifty four million dollars. That's in the New York attorney general civil fraud case. A judge found that Trump was liable and, and it imposed this massive fine uh, attack, you know, essentially against Trump. Now, he had asked an appeals court in New York to give him time to come up with that money. One uh, one appellate court judge said he wouldn't extend the deadline. That deadline is March 25th. So that clock is ticking. Now, Trump has asked the full panel of appeals court judges to consider giving him more time to post this bond or to post a lower amount. Uh, they are filing legal briefs in that case, and we're told a decision is expected at the end of the month. But this, again, another one that seems like it will come down to the wire uh, because both the end of the month and March 25th, right around the same time, which is also when Donald Trump will be listening to jury selection in his first criminal trial in New York related to the cover up of Hushman payments made to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Becky? On the screen right now you see Trump's cash crunch deadlines for legal penalties. Monday, $83.3 million for E. Jean Carroll. Then March 25th, it says $454 million for the New York civil fraud trial. So that's coming due in just a few weeks, Kara. Yeah, he really only has about two weeks to get that money together. And that is the bigger, I mean, it's such a big amount of money. It is a bigger question of will he be able to get someone to write a bond for it? Because to get a bond, he needs to be able to give them assets to secure it, whether it's cash, securities, uh, investment bonds, or some property. And so the big question there is how is that sorted out? Now, Trump had proposed putting up $100 million and then appeal the case. An appellate court judge struck that down. But an appellate court panel is hearing this. They will ultimately decide um, if he's going to get an extension to not have to post this bond while the appeal is playing out. They're expected to make a decision later this month that will coincide with the timing that this is due and also the start of Donald Trump's criminal trial in New York related to those hush money payments. Jake. All right, Kara Scannell in New York. Thanks so much. Let's bring in Russ Butner. He's the investigative reporter for The New York Times who's covered Trump's finances extensively, Ross. So the, the nearly $92 million bond that Trump posted today was underwritten by the insurance company Chubb. In order to get that bond, Trump has to put up assets to show that the insurer that he's good for the money. What might those assets be? Well, he has a certain amount of cash, Jake. We never really know how much there is. Um, as recently as a year or so ago, he it looks like he probably had 300 to 350 million dollars in cash from selling a couple of assets and a refinance that someone else did have an investment he had a piece of. But one thing we've learned about looking at Donald Trump's businesses is generally they eat cash. So if he had that much then, we would expect he didn't now. And then this bond today locks up even more of his money, right? That boxes off some portion of the money that he committed to that. 
So I think it's likely that, that, that most of the cash that he has, if he has any left, is going to have to go to um, sort of guaranteeing these two bonds, meeting the needs of whatever insurer might want on the larger bond and possibly signing over some assets that aren't already sort of uh, really encumbered by mortgages. So you've written in depth on Trump's cash position in the past that the way he does business tends to burn through cash very quickly. Does he have solid sources of cash these days, ways that money is coming in to his coffers? Well, it's it's a great question. The last time we had a perfect window on his finances was a couple of years ago. And what we saw is that when he was on The Apprentice, um, he had a, an incredible amount of money from being on the show and also from licensing and endorsement agreements that came along with that. In 2011, for example, he made $51 million just in that year from those things. That's a lot of money. But the businesses that he ran, his golf courses and his hotels, tend to require him to infuse cash on a regular basis. So as the apprentice money dipped, the licensing money dipped down to almost zero by the time he entered the White House, those businesses were starting to eat up more and more of this cash. The attorney general found there was one year where he would have been like literally out of cash except for the beneficial interest rates he got on some of these loans that were subject to this fraud case. So it, it, it does raise always questions about whether he has access to it. I think one thing is certain, he does not have access to the 500 plus million he would need for the bond in this larger case. He can't just produce that much money and keep operating as a business. And that's what they said in that filing last week where they said we could maybe get a bond for $100 million and they asked the court to consider that. So I think it's really clear that larger judgment is not within his reach. Yeah, and part of that judgment, that New York civil fraud judgment, barred the Trump organization from doing business in New York, except in order to secure loans to pay the fines in the case. Now, the ban is on hold, on the ban on doing business in New York, while Trump appeals that judgment. But if that appeal fails, what happens to the Trump organization? Well, I think first he's got to get to the bond so he can have the appeal play its way out and buy some more time. That could be an existential threat to him. But if he has to ultimately just pay this judgment, he would exhaust more than all the cash that he has. I think that's very clear. He would have to sell something. They've got a court-appointed monitor that's in place there who would oversee what he could sell. And there's really just a few pieces of his enterprise that are left that sort of help support the other ones. And if the monitor or the court decided those were the ones that had to go in order to meet the terms of the judgment, that, again, would be another existential threat to the Trump organization as an ongoing concern. All right, Russ Butner of The New York Times, always good to have you on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jake. Later today, Donald Trump will cement his takeover, really a family takeover of the Republican National Committee. Shortly, Ronna McDaniel and her co-chair will officially step down, a move essentially forced by Trump, and then two candidates that he has endorsed, one of whom is his daughter-in-law. They are expected to easily win elections for the top positions. CNN's Elena Treen is at that spring meeting in Houston, and we'll watch it unfold today. Elena. Yeah, well, good morning, John. I do want to just start with some of the reaction to Joe Biden's speech last night. We saw uh, Donald Trump. He watched the address from his home at Mar-a-Lago uh, and, as promised, delivered a live play-by-play -play on Truth Social in response to Joe Biden's speech. And it really was a stream-of-consciousness reaction from Donald Trump. He uh, attacked Biden heavily. He went after him on his positions on Ukraine and Social Security. But his attacks also grew increasingly personal. We know that House Speaker Mike Johnson warned Republicans to maintain decorum yesterday in the chamber, but that was advice that did not reach Donald Trump. Uh, he very much attacked Biden. He mocked his appearance. He mocked his hair and his walk and also claimed that he was, quote, so angry and crazy. Now, Donald Trump also responded on True Social with some video, uh, taped video messages in response to Biden's speech, one of which really trying to turn the tables on Joe Biden's argument that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, as we have seen Donald Trump do in the past. He claimed that Biden is the true threat. Take a listen. Joe Biden is on the run from his record and lying like crazy to try and escape accountability for the horrific devastation he and his party have created. All the while, they continue the very policies that are causing this horror show to go. We cannot take it any longer as a country. 
Now, John, uh, obviously we have heard this type of rhetoric from Donald Trump in the past as well as seen him uh, live post during these large events, but they do take on new significance now that he is the presumptive Republican nominee. And it also comes as his grip on the Republican Party is tightening, something we're going to see play out today here in Houston with that RNC spring meeting. We're going to see Ronna McDaniel step down from her position as chairwoman. It comes after Donald Trump and her relationship um, had really grown tense and it had been a struggle for over a year now. Uh, and we're going to see Donald Trump's hand pick uh, replacements for her glide to their path to the top of leadership at the committee. And again, this comes as Donald Trump is very eager to use the weight of the RNC, have their full interest infrastructure behind him, including their data operation, um, their ground game strategy, their pull with voters, and of course, their fundraising. But the way it's been described to me, John, by senior advisors is, yes, it is normal for uh, a presumptive nominee or a candidate to have their own uh, control in a way over the RNC or of a committee when they take power. But I'm d it's been described to me as more of a takeover for Donald Trump as he tries to sync his vision with the RNC.